Thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, next up, John Calcagni. John is a recent transplant from California to Cardiff Bay. Uh, visited in 2013 for the tour of the TARDIS. He fell in love with the rest of the city and ended up receiving his Master of Public Health degree at Cardiff University in 2018. <coughs> Previously, he's worked for healthcare technology and primary care research for the University of Michigan Department of Family Medicine, Stanford University Center for Health and Policy and Primary Outcomes Research and the United States Veterans Administration, Palo Alto Division. My pronunciation is correct. John. Hi everybody, knows wife now. Good evening. Thank you for having me here. I will be your friendly local resident alien this evening. I come in peace. Um, <laughs> Being here puts me in a fairly unique position to be able to present a broad public health policy overview and a clinical encounter experience of California medical cannabis policy from a first-person perspective. Um, as we said, uh, my background is translational research into clinical decision support in GP practices. That is a very fancy way of saying how research evidence can be applied to clinical care. I did that work for, as we said, University of Michigan, Stanford, Veterans Administration, Palo Alto. Very recently, got my Master of Public Health from Cardiff University. A lot happened in between those last two. I am one of the 47% of adults in Wales who have lived through at least one adverse childhood event. Uh, those are referred to as ACEs. I am one of the 14% who has experienced four or more. What happened to me is much less important than how it affects my health. Now, Public Health Wales acknowledges that the stress of ACEs worsens health outcomes when those children become adults. The development of mental illness secondary to ACEs is a little bit more complicated. Now, what happened to me was my brain became bad at differentiating between good stress, bad stress, and no stress. That manifested as overwhelming panic starting at age 27. Over a month, those panic attacks became continuous runs of terror. This went on and on, and I became suicidal from the sheer volume of panic. My brain changed in a way we call post-traumatic stress disorder, and I experienced this laundry list of symptoms. Now, there are, it's not just psychological, there are demonstrable changes in the body. The overactive areas that are lit up in this brain scan with PTSD are the parts of the brain that process memory. It's what's called the hippocampus in the brain. The lasting neurological changes from the original stress causes the brain and body to relive that stress. What happened to me? I had to go on disability leave from a great job that I had just started months before. I couldn't return soon enough and I lost the job. It was genuinely the nicest termination letter I've ever gotten. They invited me to come back when I felt better. But that was the beginning of a decade and counting of treatment. As is the case in the US, insurance is a problem. I needed psychotherapy, but the insurance that I had at the time wouldn't cover anything but group therapy, which is a bit of an ask for a panicky agoraphobe. Eventually, I needed specialty inpatient, inpatient treatment. The Trauma Disorders Hospital took one look at my medical records and told me they would gladly accept me as a patient, but only if I paid a $6,500 deposit, because the hospital had had previous issues with getting paid by the insurance company. You know what was covered really, really well? Yeah. By 2009, that's what I had been prescribed. I was no longer having panic attacks because I was no longer feeling much of anything. I was an over-sedated, over-medicated zombie. My short-term memory was gone. So psychotherapy had, very, had a lot of trouble sticking. I rarely left the house. I couldn't think straight. I was barely a person anymore. My choice was between numbness or endless panic. There had to be a better way. By 2013, I had reduced or eliminated most of what I'd been taking. I was functioning better. I was talking to my friends again. I went from only leaving the house to see my doctors to traveling again. Along the way, I stopped here because I'm a doctor who knew the power is right over there. This neighborhood is now my home, which is just about the coolest thing ever. So what did I do to get from 2009 to 2013 and 2013 to now? Can anyone guess? Cannabis. That's right. <laughs> Thank the cannabis. Um, in a Supreme Court opinion about medical cannabis patients' rights, 
Justice Sandra Day O'Connor cited a case that stated, a single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. I became part of that experiment, I got a medical recommendation, and found that cannabis calmed me down, helped me get to sleep, it reduced my nightmares, it helped me interrupt flashbacks, it reduced the side effect from my prescriptions, and helped me function so much better than when I was drugged to the gills. Now, this is very broad strokes about the endocannabinoid system, because research in the endocannabinoid system is still very, very new. To break it down just a little, you need two things for a system in the body, a key and a lock. Receptors of the lock and molecules that fit in those receptors with a key. Now, endocannabinoid receptors are concentrated in the brain, particularly in the hippocampus. They're also in the gut, the immune system cells, the gonads, and the uterus. The molecules your body makes that bind to them make you, make you hungry and happy and relaxed. They reduce inflammation, they reduce cramping and spasms, they lower blood pressure, they reduce seizure activity in the brain and protect neurons from damage by overexcitation from seizure activity. They're even important for fertility and fetal brain development. Now, there are hundreds of phytocannabinoids, like THC, CBD, and CBN in cannabis. These phytocannabinoids also bind to these receptors. Other molecules called terpenes have their own anti-inflammatory and anti-anxiety effects. This makes everything in cannabis work better together than separately. Doctors call this the entourage effect. Now, these molecules are fat soluble, so even after the active cannabinoids are gone, their inactive metabolites hang around. That complicates drug testing a little bit. Now, tolerance develops when you give receptors extra stimulation. Withdrawal happens when you take that additional stimulation away. Those are physiological phenomena, not to be confused with addiction. That's compulsive drug-seeking behavior that harms the user. Now, Having quit smoking cigarettes many, many times before it stuck, cannabis withdrawal is a few days of mild headaches and crankiness. So you've got a plant that manages all of these neat tricks, but it's still illegal. What motivated California to make the changes that it did? 1991 was the height of the AIDS epidemic. 200,000 Americans had died by the end of 1992. Most were gay men. The lack of coherent public health policy that lingered from the Reagan and Bush administrations due to ignorance and prejudice of a disproportionately affected minority were catastrophic to the city. These heat maps mark the addresses of people who had died from AIDS. From 6,000 in 1988 to almost 15,000 four years later. Those addresses are concentrated in the Castro, that's the gay neighborhood. Imagine losing 9,000 men over the course of four years from one community. The drugs that could halt progression and stop transmission wouldn't hit the market for years. If they couldn't stop AIDS from killing them, the patients and the people who love them needed a way to hold on until better drugs came. <laughs> Cannabis eases pain, it calms you, it gives you the munchies. Less physical and mental stress and more food intake meant a better chance at survival. It also meant that they were federal criminals. Now, California saw the value in decriminalization as early as 1975, but the political environment had changed massively. Brownie Mary, as she's affectionately referred to, was a sweet little old lady who made hash brownies for her dying neighbors. As such, she did not care how many times she was publicly arrested. It was terrible optics for law enforcement. Dennis Perone's partner was dying of AIDS and cannabis helped him, so Mr. Perone authored Proposition P. It was a successful city referendum passed in 1991. Proposition B was mostly symbolic, but its wording for the affirmation of the value of cannabis as medicine was a template for Proposition 215. Now, the state legislature couldn't get decriminalization bills past the conservative governor. But in 1966, we had a presidential election year with an incumbent who was popular with progressives. Dennis Perron made sure to get his referendum onto the election ballot, and California finally got its medicine. Now, I've included the text of the full Compassionate Use Act here for reference, but <coughs> let's focus on the important parts. And again, it affirms the value of cannabis as medicine, has an inclusive and proactive definition of usefulness. Now, AIDS was a horrible epidemiological surprise that cannabis could help. There were going to be other surprises, something the public health recognizes. The Compassionate Use Act also aimed to protect patients and caregivers from criminal sanction, provide for safe and affordable distribution, protect physicians who recommended cannabis, and exempt patients from current state drug laws. 
Now, they had to lay down the ground rules. The referendum was just an affirmation. Senate Bill 420 was the one that defined limits on purchase, possession, cultivation, patient collectives, and acceptable use. There was a lot of leeway given, however. Now, these are the limits that Senate Bill 420 set. But if patients needed more than eight ounces of cannabis at a time, they could get an exemption from their GP. It legalized sale, but cities and counties didn't have to license dispensaries in their area if it didn't want to. It provided for a statewide registry, but that registry was made voluntary because people were still afraid of law enforcement coming after people. Um, patients preferred to register with private verification registries, but it makes uptake of the medical cannabis program difficult to estimate. The estimates for California are based on data from Maine. They indicate that about 1 in 30 people had a medical recommendation by 2016. That's 1.3 million people in California. California's experiment went so well that 20 years later, recreational decriminalization passed in 2016 and sales began in January of 2018. Now, just on the law enforcement side, arrests related to cannabis went way, way down. People are concerned about the effects that cannabis has on young people, but drug overdose deaths, high school dropouts, cannabis intoxicated driving offenses, and property crime all dropped significantly more in California for those aged 15 to 19 than for the rest of the U.S. I'm having trouble getting this to go forward now. There we go. There was also significant blowback. So despite the positive effects, doctors who recommended cannabis were sanctioned by the state medical board, and President W. Bush rather cruelly stepped up DEA raids on patients and dispensaries. 13 years after the referendum passed, in 2009, the Obama administration publicly stated that it would stop making patients criminals. Medical cannabis took off in California that year, and I finally felt safe enough to have cannabis around without ending up in jail. Now, Unfortunately, those new laws did not protect people equally. The United States Pharmacopoeia used to call cannabis, cannabis, but there was some racist messaging behind cannabis prohibition in the US, and that's the reason that we call it marijuana. The reefer madness propaganda from the first half of the 20th century emphasizes foreignness and non-whiteness alongside promiscuity and danger. To this day, African Americans are still five times more likely to get arrested for possession. There are also huge financial barriers to access. This is where we get into the patient side of the experience. It looks very simple. Get the card, get the cannabis, use the cannabis, but the devil is in the details. To get a recommendation, you needed to have an actual examination by an actual doctor. Now, it's still federally illegal to prescribe cannabis because it's a scheduled substance. Most people's GPs and specialists were very wary of giving patients recommendations. Statewide corporate practices sprung up to fill that healthcare niche by allowing doctors who wanted to provide recommendations, not prescriptions, recommendations. They diffused potential liability and the workload. These same practices held and operated those patient verification registries. Patients were given paper copies of recommendations valid for one year, a license to grow at home, and a card with portable verification information. These were all considered by the state to be legal instruments, so penalties for forging them were included in Senate Bill 420. Now, doctors who gave these recommendations also provided harm reduction education on the safest ways to use cannabis and the limits on where and when you could use it. Now, all of this, this visit is costly. Now, people on state health benefits and veterans were often, they were often receiving discounts, but practices were private. That means that sort of means testing was never a given. Those entry costs were $100 to $200 just for that first appointment. This is my card, affirming the cannabis recommendation with my identifying information, the doctor's signature, and instructions for law enforcement for 24-hour verification of my recommendation's validity. These cards were usually printed on-site for patients after being examined. So now I've got the card. I had to get to a dispensary. They were hard to get to in 2009. It was 35 miles away, that was the first one I went to. By 2016, it was a 10-minute drive. They weren't always in the nicest areas because cities could zone them to industrial areas or out-of-the-way storefronts if they so chose. Security was very tight, there was usually some police presence nearby, and private security staff monitored entries and exits at the dispensaries. Now, despite the zoning restrictions, there was no association between the density of dispensaries and violence or property crime. Now, as these dispensaries were usually operated as cooperatives, you had to register again with them to designate them as a caregiver or just become part of the patient cooperative. 
Dispensaries refer to product prices as suggested donations to the cooperative so as to avoid direct payment for cannabis, still prohibited under federal law. Once you finally got inside, this is what faced you. It's Willy Wonka's Weed Factory. Now this, this is the Green Cross in San Francisco. It was concentrates, capsules of butter, really good cookies made from that butter, boiled sweets, drinks, lotions, 10 to 40 different strains of flour, three kinds of vaporizers, and entire rooms full of plant clones. Now, the people who were working there were often medical cannabis patients themselves. They were generally knowledgeable of the needs of patients like me who were completely bewildered by this. The strains were often labeled with their ratio of THC to CBD as a rough guide as to how it might affect someone. High THC and high CBD strains both have their utility. Now, I needed something that would help me sleep and calm me down, but not make me feel tired or jittery. And I got it wrong a few times. Uh, there's a strain called Romulan, named after the paranoid, angry aliens from Star Trek, which I think is completely apt. But someone else might find it really good for pain and inflammation. One size just doesn't fit all. But all of it would be called skunk here. I had never heard that term before moving here. To be clear, the UK is not doing something special to grow specifically medicinal cannabis instead of the dreaded skunk. The cannabis you get in a dispensary is the same as you get from illicit dealers, aside from being much safer, having a more ethical supply chain, and being much better quality. Now, you were also given harm reduction information at the dispensary. You were instructed to take your sealed bag of medicine, put it straight to the boot of your car until you got home, and not to hand it to anyone else, or you'd be banned from purchasing. Now, the costs remained slightly lower than street costs. It was still a lot of money per ounce of flowers, but the cost of other products was much more variable. Again, there was some discounting and means testing, but that still wasn't guaranteed. Now that I've got it, what do I do with it? Eating cannabis doesn't work well for me. It takes a while to kick in, which isn't great for panic attacks, and the effects last a little longer than I need them to. I vaporize so I could tightly control the effects, but how you use the cannabis is another barrier to safe access and equitable health outcomes. It's far more unhealthy to smoke, but it's way cheaper than buying a vaporizer with the equivalent edibles or capsules. Eventually, a lot of the guesswork was taken out of finding the best strain for you by databases like Leafly that crowdsourced data about each strain's effects. Now, the end-to-end -end cost for an examination to getting the cannabis home is quite high. Again, this is a huge barrier to entry. Moving forward, this is what I did with, I was lucky enough to be able to afford those costs. This is what I did after cannabis changed my life. I am now speaking here in the Senate in front of all of these people. The last couple of things I want to say is that unlike skunk, California is not a myth, and neither is good cannabis policy. The specters of increased incidents of psychosis, crime, and violence have just not materialized. It's safe and effective there, and it can be safe and effective here. Devolution and the current political climate put whales in a very unique position. The Assembly seems to agree that cannabis has value as medicine, but Wales needs to decide best how to move forward. The only advice that I have is not to wait for an emergent public health crisis and a five-figure body count to do something. Cannabis decriminalization and regulation is no longer an experiment. The experiment is long done. And there's good public health policy precedent in California, Alaska, Colorado, Hawaii, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Maryland, Mississippi, Nevada, New Hampshire, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Oregon, Rhode Island, Vermont, Washington, Australia, Puerto Rico, Poland, the Czech Republic, Croatia, Macedonia, Turkey, Uruguay, Spain, Portugal, Luxembourg, Slovenia, the Netherlands, Jamaica, and Chile. Why not here?